Indicii bursieri sunt la maxime istorice după ce Rezerva Federală a majorat rata dobânzii de politică monetară la intervalul 0,75-1%, iar olandezii au dat o lecție populismului. Despre toate acestea discutăm în emisiunea de astăzi. Alături de mine se află Flemislav Piecenii, este analistul șef al XTB Group. Hello and welcome to Romania. Hello, thank you. By the way, why are you in Romania? Uh, I came to Romania to take uh, part in two conferences, one in Bucharest, one in Cluj, uh, to present our views on the market to XTB clients, but also to the uh, investing public. Uh, also share them some investing possibilities that seem to be increasing uh, with the um, progress in technology. You now can take positions on different markets very easily from your mobile, from your, from your laptop. Uh, which was not possible just a couple of years ago. So we are just, you know, opening eyes to those possibilities to people, but also showing them our perspective on the market. So it's an education, no purpose. Uh, yeah? It's an uh, analytical, sort of. educational, but also um, sort of, you know, showing people how uh, is it possible to invest and trade these days. Mm, that's very interesting. We'll have a special show on that one, of exactly what's going on there. Um, we mentioned, I mentioned in the short intro that um, the Federal Reserve just increased the interest rates to oh, 0.75 to 1%. Uh, did you see something interesting in the press release or in uh, General Yellen's uh, messages afterwards? Uh, actually, the um, statement and the message that the Fed is conveying is quite consistent. So there were no major surprises. Um, from the investment perspective, uh, traders and investors uh, need to realize that what we are trading is not really the outcome itself, but it's the outcome against expectations. So it was a very interesting case because uh, higher interest rates are usually positive for a currency. Whereas here we saw the US dollar plunging uh, on the release of the decision and statement, even though there was nothing negative. Uh, on surface, but investors uh, actually had already expected uh, this interest rate, interest rate increase, were positioned for this increase, and pretty much short-term investors took away their profits uh, because the US dollar advanced heading into the meeting, uh, and therefore we saw this reaction which could be seen as strange at first, but that's what the forex trading is, you know, you need to think in advance what could happen next. So um, coming back to the Federal Reserve and the US economy, it's all good. It's not like something wrong has happened, it's not no warning signs for now at least. The economy is in good shape. The Federal Reserve is in a process of increasing interest rates, not like this was a single increase. It was a further increase since the financial crisis, but there will be more uh, even this year. The market expects an additional two uh, rate hikes this year. Is your expectation the same right now? Yeah, I think two interest rate hikes are, are quite plausible this year. And uh, this also shows that for the US dollar to keep on rallying like it uh, has been doing for the mo more than two years, it needs more than two interest rates because it's not like the Fed will increase interest rates, say, in June and that will make the US dollar happy. No, you, know, you need to have more in store in order for a move to take place. The message of uh, maintaining the balance sheet reinvestment policy until uh, the rate hikes are well on, on the way. That, that was pretty interesting. How do you see this process going on? Yeah, obviously the Fed's balance sheet is very large and it's not going to be easy and to constant. liquidate. <laughs> yeah, it's not going to be that easy to liquidate because the Fed would need to sell securities on the market. That would have some serious consequences on longer term interest rates and they play an important role in the US, more important than in Europe because mortgages usually are linked to those higher uh, term interest rates. So by selling bonds that the Fed has accumulated <laughs> yeah, uh, in the past, uh, quite simply, mm, the Fed could derail a recovery on the real estate market. They don't want to do that. So they rather want to increase short-term interest rate to make deposits a little bit more attractive to people, to make 
short-term credit a little bit less attractive to the economy, but to make slowly rather than uh, provide a shock to the economy by uh, hitting those long-term interest yeah, rates. It's, it's a huge balance sheet, yeah, we're talking about trillions of dollars yeah. and programs which were aimed and um, actually they actually su they succeeded in uh, fulfilling their goal of exactly doing this, the 30-year um, bonds, that's actually for the mortgages, the benchmark. JP Morgan Chase today, I read um, an article, uh, stock complacency too high after Dutch vote, good time to hedge against a slide. Well, yeah, um, you know, uh, as I said, in, uh, in, in, on, the, on the market, you need to think ahead, right? So when I look at the currencies, I always try to um, think, you know, what has been priced and what's possible in the future. So if there is something that could take place and the market uh, is hesitant about it, it might be good trading opportunity, fundamentally. If uh, the market is very hot on something, you, you should be ca uh, cautious, because if everyone is doing something, it's probably not the best thing to do. Yeah, if everybody does that. Also, Goldman Sachs, Allianz Global Investors, uh, they said that valuations are becoming stretched. It's a lot, a lot more and more cautioning uh, messages in, in the market. What do you look at when uh, assessing the risks to the US economy? Well, you certainly need to look at uh, a, range of, uh, a range of factors. Uh, right now, it seems like uh, there are no very strong signals that could uh, warn us that the economy could slow. There, there is a range of business, consumer indicators um, that uh, show how the demand could uh, evolve in the future. Of course, you need to take a look at um, credit, if it's doing well or not. So it's not, it's not like it was in 2007 where you had those signals from the financial industry that those subprime mortgages might not look good. And yet the equity market was uh, very strong at the time. So right now we do not have, the, we do not have these obvious threats but of course, there might be something behind the door. Uh, the valuation themselves are, are very steep. So uh, long-term investors should be certainly cautious about equities, not only in the US, pretty much everywhere around the globe and think more uh, strategically and feel more, think more, um, you know, trying not to just get a long exposure, but also think what possibilities could be um, in other trade than just you know buying equities at those high valuations and keeping them and waiting for something to happen because you know we are in the certainly around the final stage of the bull market which uh, could look uh, you know very non-standard you know just look what happened to equities after U.S. elections they stormed higher even though valuations were high already in autumn so you cannot say it's too expensive so I should sell everything because when when you move back to late 90s where we had this dot-com bubbles mm -hmm. uh, the valuations were, were completely through the roof and yet the market was moving moving higher and higher until it obviously collapsed so um, so it's tricky this final phase of the market is always tricky because you, you, you do not know where this euphoria could take you but, you know, from a longer term perspective, you, you should be understanding where you are. It's not the beginning of the recovery, it's not the beginning of the cycle, it's, it's probably some uh, late stage right now. Janet Yellen was, of course, asked about um, how she manages the monetary policy uh, as a response to a response to the Trump policies and she mentioned something until we see something um, uh, real uh, we will not adjust the monetary policy. What do you expect on that front from Donald Trump? Yeah I mean uh, the expectations uh, has been set very high uh, there were many promises that uh, needs to be uh, understood correctly are not uh, possible to f be fulfilled together so they will need to uh, pick priorities because you cannot uh, slash taxes increase spending and the decrease deficit that's impossible technically i hope our authorities can also understand that and hear that out loud <laughs> okay. yeah but uh, we will see you know I'm afraid that the market is going to be disappointed at certain stage because uh, right now it looks like 
not only fiscal uh, impossibility will, will, will be you know, understood by uh, Trump administration and uh, Congress, I think Congress understands it more uh, at some point, but uh, it's also very complicated legal process. We already see that, uh, that even though they, you know, officially they say they, are, they want to cut taxes and introduce this huge infrastructure spending program, uh, they haven't yet even shared the framework for it because they see it, say, okay, we need to sort out other issues first. So, uh, you know, the budget year in the US, it starts in October. So that's not much time to, you know, prepare all this stuff. They promise taxes in, during the summer, but uh, in, for instance, this infrastructure program, the market has been so positive about, could be delayed until even the next year. So, um, you know, a lot has been discounted, especially by uh, equities. And now it's a, it's a check time and, you know, uh, I think market could be braced for some uh, disappointment months in, in the months ahead. Yeah, we were talking last year about ETFs and actually an ETF on global infrastructure because it's a very interesting uh, thing to look at. Um, talking about Donald Trump, he's scheduled to meet Angela Merkel uh, these days and at the same time there's in Berlin a uh, sort of G20 uh, meeting. Is anything and what can happen that can could derail or produce volatility in the market? Well, certainly investors are worried about uh, trade constraints around the globe because Trump was vocal about this uh, during his campaign. So far, uh, so far, though, those risks have not uh, materialized. Actually, there were some positive signals regarding uh, Canada and even Mexico, despite all this uh, negative campaign that Trump had during uh, before the elections. Building so the now, wall in the middle. Yeah, building a wall, well. but also introducing high import taxes and stuff. Now, his administration looks more like looking for some solutions rather than just ruining everything in the first place because that's what markets uh, have been afraid of that Trump could uh, pull away US for instance from the World Trade Organization so if there are signs of this of course markets could be uh, unhappy about it uh, but for now it seems like the um, administration fortunately is, uh, is a, a little bit more constructive than uh, the pessimist, uh, pessimistic scenario assumed. This week, uh, the Dutch people um, gave a pro-confidence vote to pro-Europe. Actually, they rejected populism. It was um, a very important statement because after Brexit and after what happened in the US, we feel proud that at the core of Europe, this, uh, the results were these, and actually Eurozone volatility slumped after, after the um, uh, Dutch elections. Is this a signal for what's going to happen in France? Well, of course, we cannot be certain, but uh, a very positive signal from Netherlands was uh, high turnover. Uh, you 80% know, or something? Yeah, it was 80, huge. around 80%. Uh, so it shows that people actually, those who wouldn't have voted otherwise, uh, because they were not interested in domestic politics perhaps, uh, were agitated uh, by the fact that. Uh, you know, they just wanted these core values to be preserved. So that's a ray of hope, obviously, that uh, we could see something similar in other European countries facing elections, France, Germany, perhaps Italy this year. Um, so, yeah, hopefully uh, things will be replicated uh, elsewhere. I think in France we already see this. Uh, a mm -hmm. rise of Emmanuel Macron seems to be a sort of confirmation that a similar process is taking place and those people who were not interested to, uh, in voting are now supporting him uh, to, you know, deny a scenario where Le Pen could, you know, become a president and start some messy things with, with uh, European integration. Yeah, the awareness actually started uh, last year with the Brexit, you know, because nobody expected for them to Absolutely, actually vote. Yeah. Uh, again, with Donald Trump, Reuters posted a um, survey saying that it's a 90% probability that Hillary will win. So basically, people started paying attention to that. And my question is, what does that mean for the euro? Well, I guess uh, in the UK, um, probably in the US to some extent as well, P 
people wanted to show warnings, flags for the establishment. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, afterwards, uh, you know, they were surprised maybe uh, that the outcome they voted for actually, actually happened. Actually, yeah. it took place. Yeah. So I think negatively, I think, yeah, yeah, <laughs> negatively, obviously. Uh, so I think that uh, people in uh, continental Europe understood the message and they thought, okay, you know, we might not like the establishment parties, but they are better than the alternatives. So uh, I think this is was one of the reasons why we had such a high turnover in the Netherlands. And this scenario could, uh, could be copied in France. That would be obviously positive for the euro, for European stocks and for the uh, European Union as, as a whole. And on the other side, if that doesn't happen? Well, obviously, uh, Le Pen win would be a huge shock, at least initially, uh, especially to, to Euro, because uh, she, uh, you know, she's, she would like, to, she would like fr France to return to the franc. So obviously, um, even if the legal road would be long, uh, markets would disintegrate immediately. Uh, because we had some uh, cert certain degree of disintegration in the bond markets already in 2012 mm -hmm. during the pinnacle of the Greece uh, crisis. We had uh, you know, bond spreads at very high levels, not only in Greece but also in Spain, in Italy. People started questioning European uh, currency mm -hmm. as, a, as a common block. You know, there were certain uh, fears of this block of falling apart. Uh, which Do you remember in Bloomberg they already uh, posted the drachma? Uh, yeah, well, drachma know, is possibly... one thing because Greece yeah. ha hasn't really recovered yet. But Italy, Spain, these are very large bond markets and this had weighted on uh, Euro in a significant way. So what the ECB uh, aimed at, it was not only a recovery in general, but also uh, they wanted those markets to reintegrate, to re reconverge, and these spreads to decline. So the low uh, interest rates could be achieved not only in Germany but also in Spain, in Italy, to kickstart these economies. And they seem to have uh, been successful in this. So obviously, um, Le Pen win and fears of uh, uh, disintegration in the European bloc would be a huge blow to this success and could reinvigorate the fears of stability in Europe. Would you expect volatility as the night that we got the results from Brexit the magnitude or Yeah, I guess that could be similar. That could be similar. At least uh, in initially. Of of course, uh, you know, you need to understand that uh, Brexit vote uh, caused such a huge volatility on many markets because we got a result that uh, was different that polls uh, indicated. Even the exit poll uh, in the evening, when the vote just has ended, has been uh, positive for a remain option. Mm -hmm. So when the result started coming overnight, it was of course uh, a huge shock, right? Because people realized something else. And materialized. So that, that caused a, a huge move because investors suddenly had to reposition themselves, especially during the Asian session, which is always less liquid and stuff like that. So it's like I said initially, uh, covering the US dollar and the Fed, you all, all, always need to compare the outcome with the expectations. So it was much different and therefore it caused uh, such a big move. So we don't know what the expectations will be just ahead uh, second round of uh, presidential elections in France. But if they, for instance, were positive for uh, the opposite candidate, probably Macron and Le Pen wins, that we could expect a similar outcome on the market. Yeah, I got a bit uh, chills down my spine when you mentioned 2012 because it was a very difficult year for Europe. But I still remembered uh, the quote that sort of changed directions from Mario Draghi with the, "We will do everything it takes." So yeah, do, do absolutely. You remember that, that, that was moment? that was and a I game still changer. Remember, remember the chart. Uh, let's look a bit at the pound. What do you expect on the medium term from the pound? Well, the pound, considering all of the above. <laughs> yeah, the pound has uh, had a very rough. Uh, period, um, obviously after the 
Brexit vote and uh, you know if you look long term you could think okay the currency is already relatively cheap and the positioning is negative so maybe it could recover some um, somewhat and actually we have seen some recovery of the over the last couple of days as one of the MPC members of the Bank of England voted for a rate hike actually this first day but I think that um, bigger recovery uh, seems unlikely uh, in the near future because uh, while the macroeconomic data has been fairly stable uh, over the first couple of months after the vote it has deteriorated recently so it seems like this Brexit uncertainty is uh, finally biting into the confidence in the economy which may hurt investment which may hurt uh, consumer demand so we will see right now um, I, I think uh, one needs to stay cautious especially uh, that after um, the Brexit vote the political moves often uh, have very unpredictable impact on the currency sometimes we see wild swings uh, and then we just g get a news that someone uh, you know, has some idea about putting something to the court or some referendum or other things like this. So it's uh, it's a very political um, influence currency right now. Let's talk about commodity prices a bit. We cannot end the show without talking about gold and oil. What's your take on those? Well, oil um, has been in a consolidation, uh, but uh, recently prices. Uh, have been declining again. You know, it seems like this uh, OPEC uh, agreement on uh, reducing output um, will not be that successful at the end of the day. Well, it's not something that is so surprising to me because they have never been really successful with these output cuts, but this time markets believed uh, they could be. So we saw very high positioning for, for oil uh, towards the end of 2016. However, um, even though the discipline within the cartel has been decent, uh, there are other factors as well, especially US, which uh, increases output. Uh, the US shale sector has adjusted to lower prices. So while um, in 2014 they needed prices in the neighborhood of 55 60 dollars per barrel to be profit to be profitable to to keep going expand this drilling uh, activity now uh, the rumors are the the price for them uh, is below 40 so uh, we see a significant technological progress um, which changes the balance for the for for the oil market so the first uh, conclusion from this is that we probably will not see oil prices anywhere 100 for, for a very long period unless something very serious takes place. Uh, and second thing is that we need to be looking at uh, you know, where, how, how is the balance changing and uh, if the global economy keeps growing and uh, what are the positioning of investors. So right now uh, you know, I'm more neutral on oil after this price decline because uh, we moved from like 55 to, to 50 or slightly slightly below, but I'm, I'm far from bullish. Where's gold? Um, yeah, gold or platinum? Gold, yeah, pre <laughs> precious metals. Uh, precious metals look uh, relatively good longer term because uh, all that strong dollar and rate expectations push prices lower. Um, whereas um, uh, if you take take a look at the supply situation, it's like that these prices are getting near near production costs. That's especially the case for platinum, um, which is already um, priced below mining costs for the majority of the market. That means that uh, the most miners are losing money on on uh, digging the, the, their platinum out of the ground. So. Uh, on the commodity market, uh, it, it is a strong uh, signal and it shows that, uh, you know, unless of course some negative scenario materializes because there are various factors affecting price, uh, platinum could be especially a good um, investment for the next couple of quarters. Thank you for being the show and have a pleasant, pleasant uh, stay in Bucharest. Thank you, thank you very much. 
Așadar, doamnelor și domnilor, am discutat cu analistul șef al XTB, XTB Group, <laughs> pentru că de obicei suntem obișnuiți cu Claudiu pe România, au și ei aici o ierarhizare a lor. Am stat de vorbă cu colaboratorii noștri de la XTB și ne-am gândit să nu subtitrăm această emisiune, să o lăsăm în limba engleză, decât am face acest lucru să vă furnizăm uh, și uh, varianta în limba română, decât dacă dumneavoastră considerați că este benefic. O zi frumoasă în continuare!